Item Number SCP-939 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures SCP-939-1-3-19-53-1 89-99 and 109 are kept in cell 1163A or 1163B, 10 m by 10 m by 3 m containment chambers within armed biocontainment area 14. Both cells are environmentally regulated and negatively pressurized, with walls constructed of reinforced concrete. Access to these cells is regulated by an outer decontamination chamber and inner gas tight steel security doors. Observation windows are constructed of laminated ballistic glass 10 cm in thickness, protected by a 100 kV electrified mesh. Humidity is maintained at 100% at a temperature of 16 degrees Celsius. Specimens are monitored at all times via infrared cameras. Level 4 authorization is required to access SCP-939, their containment areas, or the observation chambers. SCP-939-101 is dismembered and stored in cryogenic preservation tanks 939-101-A to 939-101-M within Bio-Research Area 12. Access to SCP-939-101 requires authorization by two Clearance Level 3 personnel, one of which must be present for all research and testing. The contents of only one 939-101 tank may be accessed at any given time. Core temperatures of SCP-939-101 tissues must be monitored while removed from cryogenic preservation. Should core temperature exceed 10 degrees Celsius, tissues are to be returned to their corresponding tank and all testing suspended for a period of 72 hours. Barring core temperatures exceeding 10 degrees Celsius, research of SCP-939-101 tissues may continue as long as its ramblings and pleas for release may be tolerated. Containment cells should be cleaned bi-weekly. While this takes place, SCP-939 specimens will be transferred to the adjacent cell. During this time, the cell's door and observation window must be inspected for damage and repaired or replaced accordingly. Heavy sedation of all SCP-939 is required before any interaction, including transfer between cells and experimentation, may take place. See Document No. 939-TE4 for transfer and experimentation protocol. Level 3 hazmat gear is to be worn by personnel during interactions with SCP-939 specimens and in any areas which SCP-939 have been known to inhabit. Afterward, Standard decontamination procedures are to be observed by all personnel involved to ensure no secondary spread of amnestic agents occur. Following Incident ABCA 14-939-3, all non-Class D personnel interacting with SCP-939 for any length of time are required to wear two waterproof electronic pulse monitors for the duration of such interaction. These pulse monitors will transmit to a wireless monitoring system independent of a facility's main power grid, with at least one backup power system on standby. Should both an individual's pulse monitor flatline or otherwise malfunction, the wearer will be presumed dead, personnel instructed to disregard all the wearer's subsequent vocalizations, and a breach of containment declared automatically. Security personnel responding to such a breach are likewise required to wear these pulse monitors. Additionally, all live SCP-939 must be implanted with subdurable tracking devices upon capture. Description: SCP-939 are endothermic, pack-based predators, which display atrophy of various systems similar to troglobitic organisms. The skins of SCP-939 are highly permeable to moisture and translucent red, owing to a compound chemically similar to hemoglobin. SCP-939 average 2.2 meters tall standing upright and weigh an average of 250 kilograms, though weight is highly variable. Each of their four limbs end in three-finger claws with a fourth opposable digit and are covered in CT, which considerably augment climbing ability. Their heads are elongated, devoid of even vestigial eyes or eye sockets, and contain no brain casing. The jaws of SCP-939 are lined with red, faintly luminescent fang-like teeth, similar to those belonging to specimens of the genus Chaliotis, up to 6 cm in length and encircled by heat-sensitive pit organs. Eye spots sensitive to light and dark run the length of their spined dorsal ridges. 
These spines may be up to 16 cm long and are believed to be sensitive to changes in air pressure and flow. SCP-939 do not possess many vital organ systems, central and peripheral nervous systems, circulatory system, and digestive tract are all absent. SCP-939's respiratory system is atrophied and serves no apparent purpose beyond spreading AMN-C227 SCP-939 have no apparent physiological need to feed, nor any way to digest consumed tissue. Ingested material typically accumulates in the respiratory system of SCP-939 and is regurgitated once the amount is sufficient to markedly inhibit its function. Despite the absence of many vital organ systems, SCP-939 are capable of bearing live young. See Addendum, October 16, 1991. SCP-939's primary method of luring prey is the imitation of human speech and the voices of prior victims, though imitation of other species and active nocturnal hunts have been documented. SCP-939 vocalizations often imply significant distress. Whether SCP-939 understands their vocalizations or are repeating previously heard voices is the subject of ongoing study. How SCP-939 acquired voices is not currently understood. Specimens have been documented imitating victims despite never hearing the victim speak. Analysis of SCP-939 vocalizations cannot distinguish between SCP-939 and samples of known victim voices. The use of biometric voice recognition security or identification systems at any installation housing SCP-939 is strongly discouraged for this reason. Prey is usually killed with a single bite to the cranium or neck. Bite forces have been measured in excess of 35 megapascals. SCP-939 exhale minute traces of an aerosolized Class C amnestic, designate AMN-C227. AMN-C227 causes temporary anterograde amnesia, inhibiting memory formation for the duration of exposure, plus an average of 30 minutes. It is colorless, odorless, and tasteless, with an estimated ECT-50 for inhalation at .0015 mg a minute per meter cubed. In well-ventilated or open-air environments, risk of exposure to ECT-50 is greatly reduced, but not negligible. AMN-C227 is typically undetectable in the bloodstream 60 minutes following cessation of exposure. Reported sensations of disorientation and mild hallucinations immediately following removal from environments saturated with the agent are similar to recreational use of numerous psychoactive substances and easily mistaken as such. Note, March 23, 2005. This report pertains to Morphology Alpha. For information regarding Morphology Beta, see Experiment Log 914. AMTF News 7 After Action Report Addendum, November 14, 1981. A log of radio traffic between captured teams during initial contact with SCP-939 is available here. Addendum, April 11, 1982. Due to SCP-939's intense aversion to bright light, it has been deemed a minimal risk of escape. Standard fluorescent hallway lighting is sufficient to deter SCP-939-1 from leaving its darkened cell. See Addendum, September 20, 1991. Addendum, June 29, 1987. Preliminary research into AMN-C227 suggests potential for use of the general purpose amnestic. Methods of mass-producing the agent, as well as possible adverse effects, are being investigated at Biocontainment and Research Site-06. Addendum, October 3, 1990. AMN-C227 has been approved for use as a Class C amnestic, projected annual production at Bioresearch Area 12 by SCP-939 Respiratory Tissue Cultures is expected to surpass 3 liters. Addendum, September 20, 1991. Containment of nine SCP-939 specimens have been compromised following a silent night breach scenario at Biocontainment and Research Site-06. Nearby civilian settlements have been evacuated on the pretense of a coming storm. Recovery teams have been deployed to the area. Addendum, October 16, 1991 in light of this, all interaction with SCP-939 from September 8th to October 7th in the Northern Hemisphere or March 6th to April 4th in the Southern Hemisphere is strictly forbidden. No male specimens of SCP-939 have yet been identified contain a Class B amnestic See Reproduction of SCP-939 
Addendum February 20th, 1992 Effective immediately, use of AMM-C-227 as an amnestic is suspended indefinitely. Consult Incident Report AMM-C-227-939 for further information. Initial Contact Log SCP-939 the following is a transcript of radio traffic between the on-screen commander, Trapper Home, and subordinate fire teams Trapper 1, 2, and 3 of Site Tactical Contact Security Force designated Trapper during the initial contact with and recovery of SCP-939. Trapper was deployed to the outskirts of on October 28, 1981, following the disappearance of a Foundation field agent. The agent was investigating a number of localized missing person cases, as well as the loss of contact with several law enforcement officers dispatched to investigate these cases in the area. Begin transcript. Trapper home. Alright, let's get those comm checks, people. Those field masks were giving your Vox a hell of a time last time out. Agent Washburn. Trapper 1 lead. Trapper home. Trapper 2. Trapper 3. This is 1. Radio check over. Agent Michaels. Trapper 2 lead. Lima Charlie. 1. Agent Shandrick, Trapper 3 lead, gotcha 1, Trapper home, all stations, I have you loud and clear, be advised, your teams are go for entry, Trapper 1, weapons tight. Solid copy home, 3, stand by with home, you know your job, 2, keep your team tight on my flank after we breach. Copy 1, 1, stack up. Members of Trapper 1 can be heard acknowledging Trapper 1 lead's command. Execute. Alright, that water charge goes in 5. Water charge detonates. Stairs front, clear left. Door right, right side clear. Overhead's clear. Thompson on me, cross. Room clear. Trapper home. Trapper 1 and 2 reporting no contact. 2. Secure that passageway. Mark your territories and follow my team down. Keep an eye out for our man, and call it when you come down. I don't want any blue on blue, solid. Copy 1. Hoskins, you got point. Roger that, moving up. Trapper home, this is 1. Be advised we are moving forward into the structure, down a ladder well, over. Solid copy, 1. Proceed, over. Members of the Trapper 1 can be heard calling out doorways and landings as they move further down the stairs. Trapper home, be advised I'm starting to smell something rotten down here and it's pretty strong. Something's been dead for a while. Stand by. Team halt. Home, I'm looking at some shredded clothing down here. No bodies, just the clothes and nothing that looks like our man. There's the cop. Jesus, man, look at that. Looks like something just took a huge bite out of that vest. Lock it up down there, one. Washburn, get back on track. Copy home. Trapper two, watch yourselves. Something around our paws has the appetite, and it looks like it's got a pretty mean bite. Solid one. We're almost done up here. If our agent's here, he's down there with you guys. We'll be down as soon as we. A muffled human voice is audible through Agent Washburn's box feed, unintelligible and distant. One and two, freeze. Help me. Jesus Christ. Somebody. Home. Two. I think we got our man. Hustle up, people. Trapper One can be heard moving quickly through the structure. The cry for help is again audible. Home. We reached the source of the noise. We're about to get our agent back. Two. Have Doc prep the trauma bag. This guy sounds like he's in bad shape. Hoskins, do it. Two shotgun reports sound a door slamming on floor. Immediate sustained gunfire. Home. Contact. Two. Get the fuck down here. Roll and pull back. Hoskins is down. Shit. Rolling on your right. Two, hurry the fuck up. One, what the hell's going on down there? Gunfire ceases. Trapper one, sound off. Two, get the fuck down here. Hoskins is down. Hurry the fuck up. Copy one, Harrison. Thompson, you're coming with me. Gabardi, stay with Doc. Trapper two can be heard acknowledging Trapper two's lead's order. Home one, be advised. Two is en route to one's last position. Agent Washburn can be heard cursing over Agent Michael's box feed. One, be advised, your radio's not broadcasting. I can hear you, but you're- Jesus Christ, two, engage, engage! Immediate sustained gunfire. Thompson, pick up the slack. Loading. Gun up. Guys, pull it back down the hallway. Harrison, suppress that doorway. Frag out. Explosion. Gabardi, Doc, get the 60 set. We're coming up. Trapper 1's gone, and I'm dropping gas. Mask up. Gas, gas, gas. Three muffled popping sounds can be heard. Coming up the stairs. They're slowing down. Get three, Michaels. Home, we deploy VX and need three down here and mop for cleanup. Set up decon. Roger two, we're already on our way. Shit! Gunshot. Whoa, nice shot, Gabardi. Home, we've got an unconscious one. We're gonna need a mobile containment unit and medical support for the candidate. I think it sucked down some VX. I'm not hearing any more movement down those stairs, home. 
Copy 2, stand by for link up with 3, extricate the candidate, and hit decon. We're done here. End transcript. Reproduction of SCP-939 Document number 939-00-62, Reproduction of SCP-939 On September 25, 1992, SCP-939-1 gave birth following a gestation period of roughly 12 months. Litter SCP-939-A contains six specimens, numbered SCP-939-A1 to SCP-939-A6. SCP-939-A1, A4, and A5 were male, while A3 and A6 were female. SCP-939-A2 was stillborn and immediately cannibalized by SCP-939-1. SCP-939-1 made no attempts to interfere with confiscation of its offspring. Vivisection of SCP-939-A1, A3, A4, and A5 found them to be morphologically and genotypically indistinguishable from healthy human infants. Footnote 1. Several researchers who participated in the vivisection subsequently requested Class B amnestics. It should be standard policy to grant these requests after all relevant data has been collected. O5. The remains of SCP-939-A1 and SCP-939-A3 are kept preserved in Biological Materials Storage Units 939-026C and 939-026-D, respectively, within Bioresearch Area 12. Remains of SCP-939-A4 and SCP-939-A5 were incinerated. SCP-939-A6 will be transferred to for observation as it matures, it will undergo monthly physical examination, supplemented with any additional measures deemed necessary. Document number 939-A6-16, Transfer of Dr. Note, March 16, 1997. After overhearing numerous conversations between personnel, SCP-939-A6 has come to believe its name is Keter. Given the marked positive effect on his mood, staff are advised to neither encourage nor discourage this assumption. Both its mental and physical development have remained consistent with human norms. Document number 939-A6-33, Emergency Medical Log SCP-939-A6 Date, January 9, 2001 At approximately 2,000 hours, SCP-939-A6 began acting increasingly unsettled. When questioned, it reported a sense of malaise. Breathing was observed to be rapid and shallow. SCP-939-A6 was escorted to the medical ward for further examination. Heart rate was measured to be erratic, averaging 190 beats per minute. No further anomalies were observed. SCP-939-A6 was administered a benzodiazepine and returned to containment. Probable panic attack. Trigger undetermined. At approximately 0430 hours, SCP-939-A6 reported the same symptoms, accompanied by a mild headache and aversion to light. Examination returned identical results to the previous day. SCP-939-A6 instructed the rest, administered a sedative, and returned to containment. Date, January 24, 2001. Symptoms outlined above persisted for two weeks before intensifying. SCP-939-A6 destroyed the lighting fixture in its enclosure and was found to have assumed the fetal position underneath its bed at 0140 hours. A6 staunchly resisted leaving its chamber, requiring it to be carried to area medical ward. It complained of a severe headache, intense aversion to light, hypersensitivity to auditory stimuli, intense chest and abdominal pain, and uncomfortable warmth commenting that it hurt too much to cry. A6's core body temperature measured to be 41.2 degrees Celsius. Technicians were unable to locate a pulse. MRI indicated A reinforced concrete containment cell was immediately prepared for SCP-939-A6. The cell's lighting was dimmed and a large basin full of water provided at its request. Date, January 26, 2001 SCP-939-A6 immersed itself in the provided water basin and remained inactive for a period of approximately 41 hours, at which point it began violently tearing at its skin. It displayed a considerable amount of distress upon realizing its skin was slothing off, but appeared unable to stop. At 22.36 hours, Dr. 
reported SCP-939-86's head detached itself. By 2240 hours, it appeared morphologically identical to, albeit much smaller than, SCP-939-1. Addendum February 13, 2001 SCP-939-86 has been redesignated SCP-939-101. It will be transferred to Bio Research Area 12 for further study. Document Number 939-101-77 Audio Log 939-101-A Number 13 Begin Log 1016 Hours May 22, 2004 Access to Cryogenic Preservation Room 939-101 Granted to Dr. Access to CGPT 939-101-A Granted SCP-939-101 Excuse me, mister. Why are we here? It's bitterly cold and we would like to go home now. We're very late for our bedtime and we're very sorry. We didn't mean it. Have you seen our pictures? We like drawing. Daddy hung them on the wall except for sometimes when the others in white coats took him away. Daddy told us not to draw pictures like those. They made him sad. Said we did our best to draw other things, but sometimes we forgot. Sometimes Daddy hid the pictures or ripped them up. He told us it wasn't that he didn't like them. He said it was to keep us safe from the mean doctors in the white coats, but then the doctors took Daddy away. They made us get shots and told us to forget about Daddy, but we're scared of needles without Daddy around. We didn't forget Daddy. Daddy forgot us, though. We think it was the doctor's fault. Daddy wouldn't forget about us, would he? They gave us a fake Daddy and told us it was the real Daddy, but we knew better. The doctors made us get more shots. They kept telling us fake daddy was real daddy, but they couldn't fool us. We told them it was wrong to lie just like daddy told us, and then they stopped lying. They made us be by ourselves, but they gave us paper and pencils and paints and told us we could draw whatever we wanted, so we did. Sometimes we drew daddy, sometimes we drew what daddy told us not to draw. The doctors took all our pictures. Sometimes the doctors in the white coats and the people with the big black shirts with lots of pockets and helmets that carried bent windows, and what did daddy call them, I forgot. They walked with us down the hall for our checkups. We didn't like those. Sometimes we had to lay in a dark place and be really, really still. Daddy would tell us stories. We didn't always understand them, but we liked them anyways. There were stories about places that didn't have ceilings, where up was forever and the ground was white. We think it's silly. Everywhere has ceilings, doesn't it? After the doctors took Daddy away, we didn't get to hear stories anymore. Then we didn't feel good. The doctors made us get lots of checkups, and we think they got scared, so we got scared too. We had a really bad headache, and the lights bothered us, and so did noises. We wanted to find lots of cool water away from the bright lights until our headache went away. They let us be in the dark and gave us lots of water but the water made us itch all over. When we scratched, sometimes our skin came off. We were so scared, we kept asking for Daddy, but he never showed up. Eventually, we didn't have any skin left, but it was okay because we didn't need it anymore. We stopped itching after that. The light stopped bothering us so much, and the headache went away after our old head came off. Lights still bother us, but not as much as they did. We don't see right anymore. We got so hungry. It was bad, but we ate our old skin and our old head. It tasted good, but it was still bad. We were still hungry after that and asked for food. They gave us food, even our favorites, but none of it tasted right to us. All that tasted good was one piece of meat. We asked for more of that. They locked two people in the dark with us. We asked them not to, but they didn't listen to us. We weren't hungry for a while after that, but we're hungry now. We're so sorry. We know lying is wrong. We didn't mean it. End log, 1037 hours. Incident Report AMN-C227-939 SCP involved SCP-939 Description On January 30, 1992, a statistical rate of missing person reports more than times the national average was noted among civilians administered AMN-C227 following the capture of SCP- on November 28, 1990, two kilometers northwest of Pending further investigation, use of AMN-C227 was suspended. On January 31, 1992, field agents and 
were dispatched to the area to investigate. Through collaboration with local law enforcement, Agent was able to secure an interview with approximately seven months prior to the arrival of field agents reported three individuals missing under suspicious circumstances, all had been previously administered AMN-C-227. Document number 939-73 Interview 1 Interviewed Interviewer Agent Forward This interview is being conducted by myself, Agent, in order to confirm or refute the possibility of a link between the disappearances of and reported by Mr. on the 5th of June 1991 and prior administration of AMN-C-227 to all four named individuals on the 28th of November 1990. Begin log. Thank you for taking the time to meet with me, Mr. To begin, I'd like you to relate the events of June 5th in as much detail as you can. Okay, I called some friends and we decided to go for a hike. Just sort of fuck about in the woods, you know? It was a nice enough day, we had nothing better to do. I remember… Superfluous dialogue redacted. Nothing seemed strange until I commented on a feeling of deja vu. Gave me a funny look and said she felt it too. We all did. Must have been the only smart one. He got creeped out and went home. The rest of us were curious and decided to look into it. I mean, when have you ever heard of five people all feeling deja vu at the same time? Can't say I ever have. Please continue. It got even stranger. The feeling of familiarity got stronger and stronger as we neared. Yeah, huge cave nearby. I don't think any of us have ever been inside before. We only had one flashlight, and it was dumb as hell in hindsight, but we went inside. The feeling kept getting stronger the further in we went. I know I keep calling it deja vu, but that's not the right way to put it. It was more of a general feeling of familiarity. Not like this had happened before, but something about it was just familiar and nobody could put their finger on what. The deeper we went, the more familiar it felt. The more certain we felt we were getting closer. To what, I don't know. None of us know. And that's why we kept going. Did you find anything? No, well, I don't know. I remember saying something about it getting late that we should turn back. I don't remember anything after that, that until I… I… If you need to take a moment, that's fine. Sobbing. I, I don't remember a fucking th thing until s sitting on the side of the highway. It it was dark out. An officer was a a asking me questions, telling me to stay calm until an ambulance arrived. I was all cut up, screaming ab about Red begging the officer to let me g go. I had to get away. Away from what? The Red. What was Red? I don't remember. What about your friends? Th th they weren't with me. Th they think I did it, but won't listen to me. Said I, I was high on something. Th that I was coming down off a bad acid t trip. Said I c kept screaming at the ambulance's flashing lights. Th that they were going to get me. I don't remember that, b b but Red makes me feel uneasy now. Superfluous dialogue redacted. End log. Closing statement. My team is ill-prepared to investigate further. We'll be returning to in the morning to report our findings. A minimal cover-up should be necessary, depending on what's found, at least for this particular incident. To this end, I suggest Mr. be strongly implicated in his friend's disappearances. Following his conviction, he should be recruited from the prison system as clearance level zero janitorial staff and transferred to whatever installation can use him. Agent reported the possibility of an SCP-939 den in the area and an eradication detail was dispatched to investigate. SCP-939 presence was confirmed within and destroyed by February 6, 1992. On February 20, 1992, Dr. confirmed the sensation of familiarity reported by was solely attributable to a hitherto undocumented effect of a second exposure to aerosolized AM-C-227 following a first exposure of an individual to ECT. This sensation appears to act as a lure in those affected by AM-C-227, 
drawing them towards higher concentrations, most often centering around dens of SCP-939. Addendum March 1, 1992 AMN-C-227 aided tracking of SCP-939 We can use this. Anyone exposed to a concentration high enough for temporary enterograde amnesia to manifest can stalk them like bloodhounds if they know to identify the misplaced sense of familiarity for what it is. Based on Agent retracing of the route Mr. J.S. and his friends followed, we know to expect an effective range of kilometers if we use this form of tracking. No, it can't find individual SCP-939, but it can guide us to their dens. I recommend we brief a number of field operatives on this plan. Any willing would then be exposed to ANN-C-227 under controlled conditions and dispatched first to the locations of ANN-C-227 use on civilian populations. Any errant sensation of familiarity experienced by those operatives will be taken as identification of an SCP-939 den nearby and reported as such. Eradication teams will be dispatched to investigate, destroying these dens as they are located. After this has been accomplished, I believe the dispatch of these operatives to major population centers to facilitate their securing, coupled with standard monitoring of civilian, military, law enforcement, and channels of information is the best course of action to locate and exterminate SCP-939 in the wild. Doctor.